So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for coming today. We're very excited to have our first event of the fall semester. My name is Martha Stroud, and I'm the Associate Director of the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. Um, and I am going to let you know a little bit about the Zoom protocols. So at the moment, all of you are on mute. And um, but we want to encourage your questions and participation in the lecture. Um, at its conclusion, we're going to have time for questions. So feel free to write questions in the chat as they arise to use the Q&A feature, which is that should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, or you can wait for the Q&A and raise your hand and we'll call on you and you can be unmuted to ask your question of today's speaker. Please be aware that we are recording the lecture and do plan on posting it publicly. So if you are wary about speaking in a recording, you have other means by which to leave questions. But we hope that you will, you will participate and ask many questions. So with the Zoom protocols having been covered and the welcome and the check of where you all are watching from, it's my pleasure to introduce the founding director of the center, Wolf Gruner. Wolf, can you? Yeah. So, hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Marta, uh, for the introduction and for all the guidelines uh, we have to follow in this new weird environment. So welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and I hope everybody uh, and all families are doing okay in these uh, times of multiple crises. Uh, this is the first event of the academic year of the UC Shaw Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. Um, we had to deal with uh, the crisis as everybody does and uh, to kind of put all our events online, uh, a big conference we planned on mass violence and indigenous uh, communities in uh, the Americas and the Pacific region, um, uh, we had to postpone, which uh, so, uh, was planned for October. So we uh, hope that we can do this next year. Um, depending on how, uh, let's say, the kind of health crisis uh, develops uh, during the next months and the next year. So uh, first I wanted to thank uh, all our partners uh, who made possible uh, this uh, fellowship um, uh, of our kind of speaker of today. Uh, this postdoctoral fellowship was um, enabled by the USC Library Collection Convergence Initiative, which uh, was started by Dean Catherine Quill uh, Quinlan. So thanks uh, to that. She tried uh, with this initiative to bring together uh, library uh, um, staff, curators, and scholars to kind of uh, focus on certain areas uh, to, uh, of interest uh, for our university and to develop uh, uh, archival and uh, library holdings. And uh, these some of these uh, kind of uh, primary areas are, for example, the history of Los Angeles, um, California and the West, uh, LGBTQ history, and uh, our uh, kind of uh, umbrella for today, Holocaust uh, and genocide studies and exile studies. Uh, and my special thanks goes to Bill Deverell, who is kind of heading this uh, um, initiative, the Collection Convergence Initiative, and also Mario Schütze Coburn, uh, and through Luftschein from Doheny Library. Uh, uh, another partner of this postdoc was the, or is, the Fortunov Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University. Um, uh, this uh, archive, uh, and our thanks goes to its director, Stephen Naron, uh, is now uh, kind of evolved over the last uh, uh, couple of years um, as our, one of our key partners. And with uh, Yale together, we kind of came to the idea to create this fellowships because uh, to kind of stimulate comparative research in both archives, the visual history archive of the um, Shaw Foundation and the Yale for uh, Tunov archive. Um, so thanks to our partners. And uh, now I'm coming to 
are the part where I introduce our uh, guest speaker uh, for today, uh, Alison Zamori. She is the 2019-2020 USC Yale Postdo Postdoctoral Research Fellow. Uh, and as I already kind of hinted to, this fellowship was designed to foster comparative research of testimonies of Holocaust survivors um, who gave interviews to both to the uh, first, uh, to the uh, Yale Fortunov archive, and then in the 1990s uh, to the Shoah Foundation, um, uh, and uh, then are now being part of the visual history archives. What we try to do is here, it's really to kind of uh, use the opportunity of more than 1400 survivor testimony or survivors voices who are present in both archives as our curator of the visual history archive, Crispin Brooks, uh, um, found out. So to have these um, interviews uh, conducted in different time periods and uh, with different kind of uh, approaches and methodologies is really a very interesting material for the researcher to kind of compare not just the content of the interviews, but also how uh, are we conducting oral history in different settings with different methods. So Alison, uh, as the uh, holder of this first uh, po uh, shared postdoc, um, uh, did her undergraduates in history in, uh, at Grinnell College and then earned her PhD in history uh, from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 2019, uh, with her uh, dissertation focusing on the survival and resistance tactic uh, employed by young Jewish women in Budapest under arrow cross rule and Nazi occupation. Uh, for her work and research, she uh, won several awards and fellowships, including the, um, the uh, Alexander Grass Memorial Fellowship at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, and there uh, at the center, Jack, uh, Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, and also the Saul Kagan Fellowship for Advanced Shoah Studies for the Conference of Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, which is a very small and selected group of fellows. So congratulations to these fellowships. So her work uh, at uh, as the USC Yale Postdoctoral uh, Research Fellow builds off uh, her dissertation research uh, and uh, tries to explore, and she will explain this much better than I do, uh, the ways uh, Hungarian Jewish women discussed uh, sexual violence at the time of the final solution and during its aftermath. And um, uh, she compares or can compare how uh, survivors talked about uh, or discussed uh, sexual violence in different ways at the Fortunov Archive and the Shoah Foundation Digital History Archive. So uh, despite all the weird circumstances kind of, of this virtual lecture, uh, please welcome uh, me and uh, Lord, uh, uh, Alison Somogi uh, for sharing her research uh, with us today. And I hand over to Alison. Thank you, Wolf, Martha, and Fatima in the, in the USC. Oh, actually, I'm going to see if I can begin sharing my PowerPoint with you. Um, okay. Um, that worked. Um, it, yeah, this is sorry, the screen sharing is we just it's not working. Um, let me see, sorry. it's working now, um, Allison. If you it's working, okay, it's working. thank you. Yeah, if you just okay, screen, great. I I'll keep it as like this for now. Um, just for a second until I start my because my PowerPoint. Just wanted to thank Wolf, Martha, and Badima and the USC Libraries and the USC Shoah Foundation 
as well as the Fortunoff Archive at Yale University for the generous funding to support my postdoctoral project. I regret that I never quite made it to USC, although I got so close. And thank you for your patience as I navigate this Zoom presentation. Seems before when I had the whole thing up, I couldn't see Zoom anymore. So let's hope this works. Um, okay, no, let's see. Uh, share computer sound. Hope you all can see me, see this. Uh... We can see it, it's perfect, Allison. Thank you, and okay, we'll keep, wonderful. We'll keep an eye on Zoom. Um, you can just focus on the lecture. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. In the final stages of World War II and in its immediate aftermath, sexual violence against women proliferated at an astonishing rate. The instances of rape are posited to be somewhere between tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. Most cases were perpetrated by allied soldiers in their occupational zones of influence. The story of Soviet soldiers attacking German women is more well known, but American, French, and British soldiers also contribute, contributed to the astonishing prevalence of sexual violence throughout war-torn Europe. In Budapest alone, Soviet soldiers raped an estimated 50,000 women, approximately 10% of the female population of the city. This only compounded the trauma for Hungarian Jewish Holocaust survivors, some of whom had also witnessed or experienced sporadic instances of sexual violence at the hands of Nazis and their collaborators, fellow prisoners in camp, and tragically, not sporadically, rescu rescuers who hid them. As practically every Hungarian Jewish survivor I have encountered in my research from the masters to the postdoctoral level has emphasized, sexual violence was ubiquitous when the Soviets liberated Hungary. Yet it is an extraordinary testimony, truly an outlier, when a survivor admits to having been raped herself. After World War II, Holocaust survivors were effectively silenced. Jews who remained in Europe, as well as those who emigrated to North America and Israel, were made to feel that their experience of persecution, all of it, not just that which was sexual in nature, was shameful and taboo and should not be discussed. It took decades for the public to be receptive and eventually encourage survivor testimonies. Yet the subject of sexual violence remains taboo. My postdoctoral research explores how different interviewing processes and methodologies at the Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive at the University of Southern California and the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University has affected survivor test survivors' discussions of sexual violence in post-war testimonies. My project, which is titled Self-Censure, Hungarian Jewish Survivors and the Discourse Surrounding Sexual Violence, explores how different interviewing processes and methodologies affected survivors' discussions of sexual violence and post-war testimonies. 1,357 individuals gave interviews to both the Fortunoff Video Archive and the USC Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive. Thanks to the generous support of both institutions, I have identified and gone through 109 testimonies of Hungarian Jewish women seven additional Jewish women who spent time in Hungary during the war, as well as 83 testimony of Hungarian Jewish men and 16 Jewish men who spent some time in Hungary during the war for a total of 215 testimonies of Hungarian Jewish survivors. My postdoctoral project aligns with a movement that pushes for greater visibility of women and gender in the Holocaust, which challenges the assumption that men's experiences were normative and that women were either an addendum or that their specific experiences can shed no broader light onto the Holocaust. When applied to Holocaust studies, some scholars initially reacted with hostility. Critics felt the focus on 
women during the Holocaust obscured focus on Jews because this new research asserted that Jewish women were victims. Oh, oh my technology. Sorry. Were victims, but Jewish women were victims, not simply because they were Jewish, but also because they were women. Before the 1980s, women were largely absent from literature on the Holocaust. In the late 1980s and 90s, focus shifted on women as nurturers, mothers, and caregivers. Dahlia Ofer and Lenora Weitzman's Women in the Holocaust was published in 1998 and heralded a significant shift in the field, offering a more complex and nuanced views of, view of the Holocaust by focusing on a once marginalized portion, yet half of the Jewish population. More broadly, scholars of the still sparse field agree that women's voices need to be heard to reflect their own particular experiences. Their work inspired new subfield, subfields of scholarship and Holocaust studies. For example, Sarah Horowitz sought to recover the experiences of women and reshape nuances of Holocaust memory. In a similar vein, Deborah Dash Moore and Marion Kaplan have sought to apply the lens of gender to the broader field of Jewish history, in which they argue that the history of Jews has been the story of Jewish males. Still, scholars have been cognizant of the risk of homogenizing women's experiences, acknowledging that vulnerability to, vulnerability to rape, humiliation, sexual exchange, not to speak of pregnancy, abortion, and fear for one's child cannot simply be universalized as true for all survivors. More recent scholarship has renewed focus on sexual violence against women during the Holocaust. While I am encouraged by the groundbreaking work of my predecessors and colleagues, it is worth noting that it was not until 2010 that the first English language book specifically about sexual violence against Jewish women during the Holocaust was published, and there's still no comprehensive monograph on the topic. I believe my research contributes in a modest but meaningful way to this still growing field of research. As I began this project a year ago, I considered several factors that I believe might influence my findings based on the differences between the Fortunoff and Shoah Foundation archives themselves. For example, the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies began in 1979 as a grassroots, in, grassroots initiative coming from within the survivor community in New Haven. Fellow survivors encouraged one another to tell their own stories in their own words, formulating their own narrative, narrative with little guidance or predetermined questions. The earliest interviews from 1970 and 1980, in the earliest interviews, survivors were interviewed by a former survivor, Dory Laub, and a television jur journalist, Laurel Vlock. This initiative resulted first in a documentary and eventually developed into, a Holocaust, into the Holocaust Survivors Film Project, which, is, which was later renamed after a generous endowment from Alan Fortunoff and expanded to incorporate the partner projects of other grassroots survivor Jewish communities. In contrast to the Fortunoff testimonies, the Shoah Foundation began as a top-down initiative founded by Steven Spielberg in 1994, inspired by his experience making Schindler's List. It began as my wanting to continue Schindler's List, he explains in a video on the Shoah Foundation website. The initial collection came from 56 countries and was conducted in 32 languages. These days, it includes 65 countries and 43 languages, 55,000 total. The archive has expanded to collect new content for, from more recent genocides across the globe, including testimonies from current and ongoing conflicts, such as the Rohingyas in Myanmar, victims in South, South Sudan, Sudan, and the Yazidis in Iraq. Instead of coming as an initiative within individual Jewish survivor communities, the Shoah Foundation is based in Los Angeles and solicits interviewers around the globe through advertisements in local newspapers. Sometimes the interviewers were Jewish and occasionally were survivors. Once in a while, survivors became interviewers after being interviewed themselves. The Shoah Foundation developed an interviewing methodology in consultation with Holocaust historians, psychologists, and other experts in the field of oral history, eventually training approximately 2,300 interviewers, candidates in 24 countries, 
as well as 1,000 videographers, 100 regional coordinators, and staff in 34 different countries. The Shoah Foundation established interviewer guidelines and videographer guidelines to ensure interviewers could be conducted with a consistent approach. This may explain the differences that we will see in the, in the testimonies between the Fortunov Archive and the Shoah Foundation Archive. Not yet. Methods vary by country and include both far reaching media campaigns and grassroots efforts, such as the, the distribution of an outreach flyer, flyer translated into 20 languages, along with other forms of local outreach in order to locate survivors for interviews with the Shoah Foundation. The vast geographical scope and accompanying cultural differences meant that some survivors came from countries whose interest in survivor testimony was already strong and survivors were practiced at telling their stories, while others had, similar to early Fortunov testimonies, never been asked, either by family or outsiders, to recount their experiences during the Holocaust. When I began my research in August, in August 2019, which now seems like a lifetime ago, I began analyzing testimony of survivors who conducted history, histories with both institutions and was particularly interested in those who participated in early interviews with the Holocaust Survivors Film Project in 1979 and 1980, a time when survivors candidly discussed their impressions that no one wanted to hear about their experiences of persecution in order to compare these testimonies to the more ubiquitous testimonies in the 1990s. This is because my work examines the circumstances that prompt victims in this case, Hungarian Jewish Holocaust survivors, to change their stories when it comes to personal experiences of sexual assault. Many of the survivors were telling their stories for the first time publicly in 1979 and 80, and were already breaking what they considered to be a societal taboo. I am trying to discern if these survivors were more willing than survivors giving testimonies in later decades to break yet another taboo and speak candidly about personal experiences of sexual assault. I found that overwhelmingly they were not. I thought I'd give you all a chance to see a few examples of the way survivors dis discuss sexual violence in their post-war testimonies. Here I have three different survivors, all from Shoah Foundation testimonies. These represent a sampling very quickly of the varied ways survivors discuss rape and sexual assault in their testimonies. Oops, Allison, we can't hear that. So maybe oh, okay. you should reshare. Can't hear it? No. Okay, let me try this again. I'm gonna stop sharing and then I'll share again. Thank you. See, it says share computer sound. Should I try optimize screen share for video clip? No, I think that just the computer sound setting should be fine. Okay. As we were crossing the bridge at the bridgehead, there were Russians, and the Russians love kids. They just adore kids. They may be raping women, but kids they love and they gave each of us a loaf of bread. Could you hear that this time? Yes, we could. Excellent, okay. I'm gonna show you the next one. And then finally somehow the Russians won, the Germans disappeared and we had only Russians. And in the country town, it was a great panic because they were going and raping women and young Oops, the volume just went out again. Went out? Yeah, in the middle of the clip. Oh, man. Technology, thank you all for I your know. patience. <laughs> thank I you. I know we want to hear right. these voices, so. I know. Okay, I'm going to start it over. Let me know if it doesn't work. And then finally, somehow the Russians won. The Germans disappeared, and we had only Russians. And in the country town, it was a great panic because they were going and raping women and young girls. 
So all the girls and young women, they pretended to be elderly ladies. So they dressed themselves, you know, with the scarves on the heads and so on. So they will think that those are elderly ladies. Is this, this is after the liberation? Is, is that that was the liberation, yes. Let me know if it goes out. You mentioned that after a while you were afraid of the Russians too. Why were you afraid of the Russians too? A lot of girls got raped. That is just a random sampling of the often detached way survivors talked about or were prompted to discuss sexual violence in their testimonies. That's overwhelmingly what I heard. Now I'd like to turn our attention to two survivor testimonies that I feel that I feel had some sort of influence and cha some sort of external influence changed the way they spoke about sexual violence in their testimonies. First, I will pre present the testimony of Valerie Firth. In her oral, oral history conducted in 1991, now held in the Fortunoff archive, she shares the story of an attempted rape. I was not able to get this embedded into um, this PowerPoint, so I apologize. If, just bear with me for a moment. Hopefully, this does not. Um, let's see. Hopefully, I don't lose this. Let me know if this works. The contact we had. There was once I was, uh, there were Polish prisoners, political prisoners coming in to work. And um, I heard that some of them have some uh, food and you might be able to get some from them. And um, I, one morning I thought I'll try to get some something from the prisoners also. And I went to, a, it, it was near one of the barracks, I think, and there was, there was a Polish prisoner working, and um, he, uh, I asked him for some sugar or something. He had a, with him a uh, sort of a lunch bag. I asked him if he can give me some food, and he said, yeah, but first come here. And he pushed me against. The sound just cut out like one second ago. Oh my. I don't know why this keeps happening. I apologize, everybody. Maybe, should I try optimize screen share for video clip? See if it works better? You could try. It, it made okay. it more pixelated the I last know. time. Let's see if I can just get through this one clip. I'll go back just a little bit. Now it's not playing. Oh boy. I can <clears throat> finish up reading this quote from her. Um, go back to sharing my PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so she's talking about uh, when she was in Auschwitz and how she, there was a, an attempted rape. Um, she had experienced an attempted rape by a Polish prisoner who was working and she asked him for some sugar and he pushed her up against a wall and she managed to disentangle herself and run away. And uh, four years later in 1995, she conducted an interview with the Shoah Foundation. She did not, however, mention her exper this experience of attempted rape by the Polish prisoner. And that's why I don't have a corresponding clip from the Shoah Foundation to share with you. But I am now going to share with you a series of clips that highlight the contrast 
between the two archives to the greatest degree I have found. You can see for yourself some of the starkest differences between Francis Goldstein's interviews from the earliest Fortunoff archive testimonies from 1980 and the Shoah found, her Shoah Foundation testimony in 1996. So here. Uh, uh, my name is Sylvia Brown. I'm going to, this is the whole testimony, so I'm just going to start at the point that I want to make. Um, she is being interviewed here with her sister, which is unusual for these testimonies. This is one of the, I think this might, this is listed as number four of the Hol Holocaust Survivor Project. She's interviewed here with her sister. Um, I think I could start it here. This is right after the German occupation of Hungary. In the morning, the SS were already roaming around town and, and they were knocking on doors. They wanted girls. They were knocking on our yeah, door, I, 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 and they wanted to know uh, yeah. for girls. I, 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 so my sister, she was the older, yeah. she jumped out of the window. But so do you remember, I remember I was sleeping with my sister in one bed, you know, and the knock came in, and they came two soldiers, you know, with bayonets. My father spoke German because he worked for Grof Tilo Winkler and he learned in, Hun in Hungary, he was brought up in Hungary and he spoke German too. And he, they came out and they opened every door and I was sleeping with my sister. I must have been maybe 17 years old. So we were all covered up with a, with a quilt. And then they went in the other room and I heard, you know, German to Yiddish is very, uh, so, some things you can experience, you know what I mean? And I heard one tell the other one, And the sound just went quiet again, Allison, just a minute ago. Okay. 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 Thank you again for your patience to the attendees. This is obviously completely out of our control. Just see. But that high, you know, to the garden, yeah. And I ran out with my pajama only, and I was wandering the whole night, you know. And he was coming in, and you were my next door. There was a lawyer. No, so the, I was in the camera. I was hiding. You know, that was in the middle of the night already. I was hiding, and I, I remember my father said, "No, he only had one girl." You know, he once said, "Yeah, I see two heads there." You know, my father was trying to tell, confuse him, like. You know, my sister was left because she was a kid yet, and I was already 17 years old. And when I jumped out, he came back, the German, he says, he remembered seeing two heads. And then time I was hiding in the camera, you know, in, the, in Europe, we have outside like wood. A wood and set. I was hiding there, they went looking, and they were killing the morning. They you know, were the, looking for girls. For the girls. They were I remember for seeing girls. two for girls what? in the, the bed. German soldiers there. For said. what? For, for, the, for their own pleasure, you know, they came in and he he remembered seeing two hats, two girls, in, under the bed, that because we were covered up. You in know? 1944, that the German the SS came in. tried to uh, round up Jewish girls for yes. sexual yes. Yeah. intercourses. Yes, yes. And from there on, that day, then my had aunt had a, a, pantry. a pantry that was sort of like built in off the kitchen. And so there were my cousins and my sister spent about two weeks yeah, living very, in that very pantry. Very Every early in the morning, we had to get up very early and go in the, from the back. the back all the way to the back to my, my aunt's house. And we were hiding in that pantry and they put a kitchen. Uh, in Europe, uh, they have like for dishes, china, a, 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 a a china to put into the, to to the door, to the close doors, it. When so you, you come in, you couldn't see that there the, is a door that there is a door back, you know? So all the girls, we would, used to hide there. And from day on then, we never seen the light out. We were hiding there till a day after Passover. Do you know of any Jewish girls that were taken with us? I remember. Oh, okay, I'm well, sorry about that, but. One. Um, that was pretty much the end of the story. They said that they um, did not know of any Jewish girls that were taken, but here is, Francis Goldstein's 1996 Shoah Foundation interview to give you a sense of how it's different. Um, the next clips are, even, the differences are much more extreme. 
I remember one after in the night a German officer came to me had the matzahs already prepared on a closet, you know, put not basically matzahs and he threw everything down and smashed it. Then he came in the other room and I was sleeping with my sister. And then he was because German is similar to Yiddish. I heard where is the Freulein and I just slipped through the window in the garden, you know, and was going around till my father came and said it's okay in the middle of the night to come out. And ever since then, my aunt had a pantry and we girl, my cousins and myself, we were blocked in on the door, they put a, a closet. So in daytime we were all hiding there, and in the night we came out. What was your fear if they found you? We were afraid they'd go and uh, take us uh, to rape the girls. So we were hidden in, in daytime. In the night by the garden we went to sleep. Then early in the morning when it was dark, my Bobby went and took us back in the, in the pantry to be covered. When was the first action taken that you remember in your town? So this next clip that um, the sisters are already in the ghetto and uh, th this, these two next two clips, you can see the most extreme difference. A small slice of bread and he was hungry. And then every morning, the people were going to the gate, you know, looking to, to go in to work. They were liquidating all Jewish prop, Jewish linen, Jewish furniture. They were all shipping so to Hungary, to Germany, you know, they from, from the city, from all those wealthy people. And people were getting out to go to work because when they were out, they could they were able to get a I remember one morning I got lost and I went to the get, I went to the, to the gate. And I was chosen too, you know, they, they just picked people. And, and then the rumor, the and the rumor came, you know, that they took the girls. They did two girls out. I was lucky. I was working very hard. And I, I got lost, and I brought bread, and I brought things into the ghetto, you know. From then on, every morning I went to work. And I, before I came back from work, my father asked me from far away, like, with a hand, what did they do to you? So you know, like today. I can understood. I said to shake with the hand, and then my father said that I had to wear a scarf, you know, to look make myself old, and I shouldn't, you know, they didn't want to let me go out, and I said, I begged my father, do I go out? Nothing's going to have to be there. I'll take care of myself, but I can bring in so much food that the kids could eat. And then my father agreed, and I went out from that day every day. And then one day, the big captain came in, and he seen that I worked very good, and he chose me that I should clean his place. He was a captain in the police force, and I was chosen for him to, to to clean his place and make it nice. They brought in all the Jewish furniture and the linen and all the silver and everything, and I was supposed to make him a living quarters. And I worked very good, and he he began starting after me, you know, I was 17 years old. He could have been my father, you know, and then I started crying, but and he kind of had a little mercy, and he left me alone as he brought in. You know, he picked other girls from life, from the ghetto, whatever he chose, in to his place. And he let me clean and do it from there on. Every day I brought in and all from the ghetto. All the children came to my mother and the wife because I was already known there. And they didn't search my things when I came in in the, in the ghetto back from outside. They didn't search it because they knew that I worked for the captain. But you keep saying this was a ghetto, and really it was... This was a ghetto. This no, was but a, the, a this ghetto, was, there are places to sleep and no, houses, this was but a, this was... This was, they called it the Teglajar, means in Hungarian called the Teglajar, means the, the brick factory, there was our ghetto. We were there, but for six weeks, open place. And there were, there were people dying down there, there was nowhere, there were no, a toilet brought, was an open space made a hole, like a hole. and there where people they, were going. They uh, brought in all the Jewish patients from the hospital, they brought from uh, the uh, mental institutions and uh, all the beggars, 
from the streets and all the people. They were all congregated in that brick factory that they kept uh, the Jewish people until they uh, liquidated. Towards the end, after the four about the, uh, after four weeks, they started to liquidate the the, uh, the, the, the ghetto. They were taking people, but nobody knew no. where. The nobody rumors were, knew. where, where we go, and we go into work, we go into work, they took a transport out of the ghetto, they took, it took uh, uh, maybe a month or so each time to And it was they less say, and less people in the place. But I like to, to remind here while I was working, and that kept, you know, and there people knew who were better. So I ended there, I just wanted to, highlight that she was interrupted and brought it made the point of bringing it back to the story that she was telling about this captain who was sexually assaulting girls um these as well as like and this is how she talks about it in her 1996 show foundation interview then i was selected cross from the ghetto was the captain of in charge of the ghetto and of the, the police do you remember had, his name no okay. when i came back from he lived in that i know he was from debretson and i wanted to remember his name after the war that you can begin imagine i just couldn't i only know that he lived in debretson a son of a uh, uh, if you looked at him, you got scared. But because I took care of it, me and another girl, we were cleaning all Jewish stuff they brought in from the homes, the embroidery tablecloth and the silver and the gold stuff, and we arranged for him an apartment and a house. So we were working there, and I could come and go and bring in stuff. They didn't frisk me to bring in uh, food for the neighbors, for kids, a little milk, a different, because they did they, the food they what they were giving it was impossible to eat. And this was going till we didn't transfer. When we transferred, uh, that was the end. Where were you transferred to? to so you might notice she doesn't actually mention that he was sexually assaulting girls in this interview. Now. These last clips, she, there are other clips that I have, but that I am just for the sake of time, not showing. Um, when she does talk about other instances of sexual assault or attempted sexual assault, um, she, she never talks about having herself been sexually assaulted. But these last, last clips that I'm gonna show you are not about sexual assault, but I wanna show them to you anyways, because they highlight just how different the testimonies by the same testimonies by the same survivor can be depending on a variety of external factors. It was, was already uh, uh, and as you can see, this is she's talking about returning home after the war. She had been with her sister, who is with her in this inner in is sitting next to her now, and but who was with her in the camps, and they got separated. And this is what happened when she returned home and found her. Meet you know what I mean? So you start looking, people were going left to right, this from this camp, the other one from America. Everybody was trying to learn, have you seen my mother? Have you seen my father? Have you seen my sister? Have you seen someone from Bresna? You know, have you seen my cousin? Have, you know, everybody was busy running, looking for themselves, you know? And I traveled through all the way till Ushkarot like that. You know, open trains, trains that was carrying big bulk of trees. You know, we were on the top of that. We were going, or on top of the tree of, of the train in the top, and we were going up to Chop. And Chop is the Krijovatka. You know, where all the trains, if you want to go in, the cross road kind of. And as I came in, you know, Mank porches me. And he says, "Aren't you Kopolovich's daughter?" And I said, yes. I said, why are you bothering me? You know, he says, didn't you have a sister? I said, don't you know I had a sister? We were so many kids, you know. Everybody was so nervous, you know. Tell me, you know, because everybody was asking, have you seen my wife? Have you seen my mother? Yeah. You know, and everybody. I said, why are you bothering me? He said, didn't you have a sister? I said, yes. Your sister is alive. My sister is alive? Where? You know, I've sat tearing that man apart. And he says, he, she's in Usharat. And he was going to Usharat to ride on the train. I was pushing the train all the way to Usharat. Finally, we came into Usharat. And I was walking the front. The man couldn't keep up with me to show me which house my sister is. 
And I, he came into a house. He said, this is the house. And then I came in, opened the door, and there was like a big yard. And I look, and I see as a sort of a big window. My sister had to have nothing new here, and she was standing like this, she was sewing. I only see her profile like that. <laughs> then I came to the door, and I just screamed out her name, Suri. Then all the people came in from everywhere. <coughs> then I grabbed her, and we both fell down. <coughs> and this is the way we find each other. <laughs> Then I went into the house where she was already. For a long time. <laughs> Stop talking. Who came? Who went? There was nobody there. Only two of us. And she was telling me that she was already at home. <laughs> when we were born, and she didn't find nobody there. <laughs> and I, I told her that I made myself a promise. If I have to be alive, I, I have to go to, to my, my, home, my home where I was born. He said, don't go there. Don't go, it's not there. <laughs> but I had to go. She couldn't stop me. She, she begged me not to go. I said, no, sorry, I got to go. I made myself a promise. As I was going alone, the bridge was marked. The bridge, the bridge was was bombed. Where did you go? I went from Usharat to the train to Little Barras. Why did you want to go? I wanted to go home where I was born, where I lived, and I got to see it one more time. So I took a train up to Little Barras, and then the bridge was bombed, and you got to walk, you know, but an hour and a half or so till Velki Barras. <laughs> where I was from, and I walked, I walked, and I came into town. I just wanted to kill everybody to my place. I couldn't face nobody. I couldn't face. I was walking from up the street till I came to the house where I was born. And it was not that I went to the house, to our house with my father. And it was every Everything was taken apart. Everything was not left. I went to the yard and everything. And I was just beating the ground. I just couldn't get myself together. <laughs> then they come, the Gentile people, the neighbors. You know, they came and I just wanted to kill everybody. I just wanted to take her away and I just felt when I come in there, I'll just tear them apart. There was already a family living there. And Belki Beres, my friends, and they told me, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. They were holding me. They don't do that. And everybody was coming around and there. My father is that didn't give him the satisfaction to tell him that they that. I told them they're all alive, they're all in Budapest, they mean I just came here alone. They, I couldn't give them the satisfaction to tell them the same that they don't want to give them. So now I'm going to show you hey, what, what, how she tells similar, tells the same part of her story in 1996 to the Shoah Foundation, 16 years later. And we went further, so with a train, we went till I came to Chop. Chop in Czechoslovakia was the crisscross road. Any place from the Carpathia, you had to come to Chop. When you went to Prague, or you went to Budapest, or you went, you had to come there, and from there you had to change to a different train. That time people already start coming, that mind you, it was already May or June. People were already coming from different lagers, you know. Did you see my mother? They did find which lager, where were you? People were wild, they were looking people. A guy came back to me and he says, Aren't you Kopolovich's daughter? I got so yes, yes I am. He says, I I 
I know your sister is an Ungva. My sister. I never thought my sister was going to be alive. She was always sort of like a sickling. She always had a cold and she was a kind of denty, you know what I mean? My sister, I know my brother Heimberg because he was healthy. My sister, as soon as she alive, I got hysterical. I just couldn't wait the train to come. And we finally came into Usharat. He was running after me because I was running on the street, you know. So finally we came into a house and he says, here is your sister in this building. And in Europe, in Ungvar, they have gates like, you know, you open a gate and you come in and they have like a court and there is the apartments around. So I came in, there was like a bay window. I seen my sister's profile like in the side, little hair. You know, the same as much as I had. And I screamed out, Suri, like a lion. All the people came out. I don't have to tell you, we collapsed on each other. And the rest of people of us on the floor, they couldn't believe for days that it's true that she, she was in life, full with lies yet. We couldn't believe we were sitting and waiting, you know, that my father would come home. My brother, Chaim, who was after me, running from one place to another. Nobody came back. And, just give you a quick and from there on, we decided I didn't want to stay in Ungva. I wanted to go to Czechoslovakia. This is, I never wanted to remember. We went home to my hometown. I came into Velky Beres, me. And I had to sleep over a night at a chanta. I only wanted to have a katusha and be the hell out of everybody there. And I looked around the house, we had a brand new house on it. was all knocked out, the doors, the things, my father's business, the roll-ups, the windows, everything was big enough. I stood there, I couldn't even go in the attic to look because there was no ladder up there. I was just looking and looking. See my father there, my mother and the whole family and my sister and I, we cried all night. And I said, never again that I come back here. And I did. What I would like for you to take away from these clips are the following points. The presence of Francis's sister, Sylvia, cannot be understated. Throughout the two hour plus interview, the sisters clearly provided moral support for one another, with Sylvia stroking the arm of Francis whenever she became emotional. This may have given Francis the fortitude to insist on finishing the story she was telling about the Hungarian police captain who had been notorious for raping young Jewish women in the ghetto in Ungvar after she had been interrupted by one of the interviewers who felt the need to inject at just that point with a non sequitur about how the brick factory in Ungvar could not have been a ghetto. This gives you a sense of how an interviewer can shut down a survivor who mustered the courage to tell a difficult story. As you may have noticed, she did not repeat the story, this part of the story in her Shoah Foundation interview, although it's impossible to know exactly why that is. I suggest the presence of her sister is a defining difference because at the end of her fortune off interview, when Francis spoke of being separated from Sylvia for 12 years after the war because she could not obtain a visa to the United States, Francis became hysterical, sobbing for four minutes straight, appearing at one point close to fainting, reverting to fragmented Yiddish, at which point the interview had to be ended. I will share with you the testimony of Lily Wolf, Wolf to show you what an outlier testimony looks like. 
She was only 16 years old when a guard propositioned her. At the time, she and her brother were being held in the courtyard of a synagogue in Budapest, along with a few hundred others because they were not Hungarian citizens and they were about to be deported. So there was, as I said, uh, from government employed detectives, as we called them, who were watching the main gate so that we who were in that school yard do not walk out. And he was a man, I was, can't emphasize, I was 16 going on to 70, and he must have been around about 30, I can't recall him exactly. And, um, well, he said to me, if I come to his apartment home, he'll take me out and he will rescue my brother and myself, but, what is that English expression, uh, in return of favors? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in return of sexual favors. favors. That's right. Anyway, so I did go and he did let us go. So he kept his word. And would you believe, 20 years after I saw him in Australia in Sydney? But well, that's besides the point. So anyway, he, uh, he was very decent. He took me to a cafe house and gave me uh, cakes and I was very intimidated. I was so shy and so uh, closed within myself, I couldn't even talk. So it was really just, uh, uh, from as far as he's concerned, a sexual uh, contact. I, I was a young girl with a very good dancing body because, uh, by the way, that I forgot to tell you, I wanted to become a ballerina. And my father had some connections with uh, stage people. And when he left, he made me a promise that I can go to a certain ballet school as long as I want to. So that promise I got and I did go. So from the minute he left Budapest, I went to the ballet school not far from us until the cutoff was that I couldn't go out the street, etc., etc. And after the war, I, I continued. Mm -hmm. But I had always a very dancing, good body, ballet, classic ballet. And um, he took a fancy, and as I said, that went on for a few weeks. And he took, after when he knew that there is danger coming, because he knew. He took us out, my friend and myself, and went to Grandma. So when, so when you say that that at that time you were going back to his apartment, mm -hmm. was Frey, was, was your brother, for instance, still in this holding? That's right. He stayed in the holding. He took me out at two o'clock in the afternoon, brought me back at six in the afternoon, right? Right. And whenever, he, well, not whenever, once when he knew that there is danger, that they're taking the whole group and taking them to the train station. He took Freddy and I and let us go. Right, and you returned to your grandmother's flat. Yes, flight. but by that time we didn't live in the same apartment. So, so when you say that the Russians were street fighting, does this mean that in some ways this was liberation? Yes, that right. was liberation. Right. So we got liberated, If I can't remember, 14th or 16th. And I marched with them street fighting to get as soon as possible to the ghetto. Mm -hmm. Now that was one of the incidents where I got caught by three Russian soldiers and by gunpoint they took me up in an apartment which was bombarded, the glasses were out of the house because there was not one house in Budapest which had the glasses in it and they packed raped me then. And that was something which I am surprised that now with my old age I didn't have any hang-ups uh, human beings wise or sexually or anything. I only know that I begged them to leave me alone because, and I said doctor, doctor, it most probably in Russia, it has not, in Russian language it has not got the same uh, emphasis, as the, not the same meaning as what it has in the English or in the Hungarian language and they didn't take any notice of me whatsoever. What do you mean you said doctor, doctor? I did, at that time, I don't know whether you're aware of it, the people who were fed by a 
the Jews, let's say, in the ghetto or in that protected house, we've got something in our food which stops us from menstruating. Now, automatically, when I was out of that ghetto already for two or three weeks and lived in that protected house, that was missing out of our, and I started to get my period, which is not normal one, but was a brownish. Now, don't forget, I was full with life, uh, lice. Uh, I had the same clothing on, and I mean the same, from September onwards. So it was September, October, November, December, January. I was full, as I said, with this uh, uh, lice and my hair and my body. I had different lice in my hair and I had different lice in my body on the clothing. I didn't know what water was like for shower or for washing yourself. And it was very unpleasant to know that three guys are there raping you when you have a period which is brown and, and ugly and so after these, uh, well, they weren't very satisfied. I didn't co didn't cooperate with them. And they left and said, you can take what you want. You just showed me that uh, I can take what I want from the flat. And they disappeared. I'm just wondering, Lily, whether when you think about the liberation um, for you, whether it's, it's a mixture of, of a lot of joy and pain. Yes, well the joy was that I, uh, that whatever, whoever survived in the pain was very much that my brother didn't. That is a great, uh, because then I lost my father and I lost my mother, but we, somehow we two were hanging on to each other and that was, yeah. And when you think about um, the Russians, does that also the whole um, sexual no. assault, is that something that... No, it didn't bring bad memories. I tell you frankly, I was thinking all my life, these soldiers were fighting for somebody else's goodwill, life. They came through from Russia, left their families, and they came to a, a hostile country, Hungary, where, all right, the Jews were there to liberate them, but they were already on the way for years, these Russian soldiers. They were frustrated. They found uh, grateful Jews who were kissing them and hugging them to, to liberate them. And of course, for them, they're not the most educated people. For them, it was the open door to go and rape us or have sexual intercourse or whatever. So I looked at it from that point of view and um, I, I haven't got bad uh, feelings towards Russians, really and truly. So you have almost like a very practical kind of... Mentality f to the whole, yes, I have. Mm -hmm. And I haven't had, as I said, any hang-ups. I have bad memories and I was affected by the whole uh, year or year and a half that we had concentrated very bad time in Hungary. But uh, I don't consider myself a nutcase, if you know what I mean, because they are, and I do understand a lot of people who went through the concentration camps, who went through certain uh, hostilities the same way as I did, that they became a bit paranoid with anything what has co in connection with, with uh, Germans, they don't want to speak the language anymore. I know of people who went through much worse than I and they don't want to talk about it. And you don't feel this? No, no, I don't. I feel that we should. It is our duty to let the world and the future know what has happened so it never ever happens again. Mm -hmm. I can only tell everybody in the future they should hang on don't give up, because I could have given up many times. There were even small incidents in that year where they put me to the wall with a gun uh, at me, and I just hoped and hoped and, and uh, didn't think that everyone is as bad as certain people, and mm -hmm. I survived it. So put a little bit of hope into the future. Some of us do survive 
to he to tell the story mm -hmm. and I think the youth of the future should not give in okay before we get to some of that I'm just wondering um, when and how did you eventually come to Australia well when this rape thing happened and we got to the with the family I as I said oh I didn't mention I got gonorrhea through that incident and um, I uh, didn't have any medication, there was no medicine at all. So a month or two after we got a Red Cross parcel from the Australian relations and in there was a medication for that little girl and the grandma, uh, uh, penicillin, but they survived it without the penicillin, so the penicillin was used to me and uh, cured me for my uh, gonorrhea, so that was okay. I don't know what is different about Lily Wolf other than the fact that she clearly managed to create a narrative for herself about the Soviet soldiers that seems to have exonerated them in her mind. I don't know what's different about this testimony. If anything, the interviewer interrupts Lily quite frequently. You guys didn't really see that. Um, I do think it's interesting that she is willing to talk about it and she shares this not just one but two stories of sexual assault. Unfortunately, there's no Fortunoff testimony for Lily Wolf to compare with the Shoah Foundation testimony. I believe the social mores and taboos that have shaped survivor narratives are still relevant today and can inform our understanding of the external factors that might encourage someone who had previously denied an assault to later share more of her story. While my research is ongoing, what I have come to find is that despite the statistical improbability, no matter the varying interviewing processes and methodologies, Hungarian Jewish women overwhelmingly deny having personally experienced, the, experienced sexual violence, although the ubiquity of rape is mentioned in almost every oral history. The taboo about the Holocaust may have changed in the last 75 years, but the taboo surrounding sexual assault clearly has not. It is only the extraordinary outlier who is willing to share her story or share more of her story when she has every reason to believe that no one wants to hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison. If we were all together in person, I think we would all be applauding and um, thanking you for your lecture. So um, now we would like to take questions. We still have some time for questions from the audience. Again, you can type questions in the chat. You can <coughs> raise your hand with the raise hand button at the bottom and we will call on you to unmute you or you can use the Q&A feature to ask a question. Um, and I don't know, Allison, now that you're not sharing your screen, you can probably see the chat and people are saying what a good lecture it was. So while you were speaking, one question came in on the chat that I'll start with um, that while people are formulating their questions. Um, it was from an attendee who wrote, my father left Hungary before World War II and my mother just after. They met in London. My father's parents were killed in Auschwitz. I was born in 1961 and was brought up not knowing I was Jewish not until my 21st birthday. How common is or was it for survivors to deny their background and bring up children without Judaism in their lives? Sorry, I'm smiling. I don't know how common that is, but that's my father's story. So um, my grandparents left Hungary in the late forties, came to the United States. And I think that my dad and my aunt might be on here so I don't know I shouldn't speak for them but they didn't know that they were Jewish until they found a photo of a gravestone with some Hebrew on it I think that my grandmother's aunt was already living in the United States and she asked for them not to share it so I think it's you know I don't know how common it is but it's clearly my my dad's story so could be pretty common Great. Okay, my colleague Badema Pitich is going to read some of the questions from the Q and A. Yes. So Sana Hatchpet uh, has a question. 
about uh, how her 2010 publication on sexual violence against Jewish women during the Holocaust that you referred in your lecture uh, really played into your research and affected it overall? Um, I mean, every single, all of the research on sexual violence during the Holocaust has been incredibly helpful for me to, to as background because without that, I have would have nothing to work from. And so all of that, I can use that as theory and I can use that as secondary sources for my writing. So everything that other people have worked, have every, all of the other research that people have done is incredibly helpful for me. And I'm very thankful for all of the work that everyone has done before me. Thank you. Another question from Q&A is from Maya Cruz, who is asking, how are the experiences of sexual violence expressed in the indexing terms for the interviews? Uh, which kinds of words are used and are they different in the two collections? Um, I found s sexual assault, I'm trying to think if, I think also, I'm trying to think if rape was also there. And then, but it was, very inconsistent um, what it w referred to. And I really depended on, in, in both of them, it really depended on what the, whoever was indexing the uh, testimonies, I got like what they, what they thought was important. Cause it could just, ref it could just mean that the survivor mentioned it that would just say mention you know the russians were raping women or that this happened um but at the same time there were so many testimonies where that would not be indexed and, and the exact same sort of thing was being mentioned so i think it really just depends depended and that was for both the Fortunoff and Shoah foundation testimonies and so i just really had to go through all of them because I think it really just depended specifically on like what people who were indexing them found to be found to be important as they were going through. All right. Another question from Rochelle Seidel uh, is that whether you're aware of the 2012 groundbreaking symposium that took place at USC Shaw Foundation that was about sexual violence during the Holocaust, and it was co-sponsored by Remember the Women Institute and the Shaw Foundation. I'm not aware of that. I said I, ha I had been. I when I started, I started my PhD in 2012, and I was not working on this subject at all. But no, I actually am not aware of that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm going to write that down. Um. Annette Tim is asking, do you have any information about the indexers themselves uh, when it comes to indexing these testimonies in which sexual violence is discussed? Um, so I spent all of my time working at the Fortunoff archive because I was supposed to split my year between Yale and USC and I had just arrived in LA in um, March and USC closed down. So I really know, I would say I know more about that, what, um, how that was done at the Fortunoff Archive. And I believe that it, I believe it was student workers doing that. I hope that I'm not wrong. Um, and other workers doing that who, um, and a lot of really good workers, working on that and they have a lot of people doing different translations and indexing and all, all sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> but I think because they're, I mean, most of what was when the question about indexing sexual assault, like 99% of it was just common in, in, in the case of the hung in the Hungarian case, because they were mostly not all of them, because some of them um, ended up in other zones of occupation, but the ones who ended, were in the Russian zone of occupation at the end of the war, they, almost all of them, the women's testimonies mentioned uh, rape and, but not all of them, not, most of them actually did, don't have sexual assault index, 
Um, but I, I'm not exactly sure who was doing the indexing, but I know that there were a lot of student workers working at the Fortune Off Archive. Um, I saw them working there. I see Sari Siegel is here, so maybe she can answer that question. Thank you. Svetlana Oshakova has two questions, mm -hmm. so I'm just going to read them both. Um, the first one is whether you analyzed testimonies about sexual assault in other languages, like Hungarian or Yiddish, and if yes, did you notice any difference? And the second question is whether you noticed any differences in the interview methodology and style for the two organizations in question regarding the cases of sexual violence? So I don't ha actually cannot analyze anything in Yiddish. Um, so I would have not been able to work with those. And I actually surprisingly did not have any of, I was going through this list of, um, of testimonies where people of survivors who had interviewed both with the Fortunoff and the Shoah Foundation. And I think because potentially maybe that meant that they were overwhelmingly had immigrated to the United States, none of them were in Hungarian. And so it, did, it just didn't come up. Um, but it's definitely, I mean, I always anticipate that there would be some differences between testimonies of survivors who immigrated to the United States versus ones who stayed in Hungary versus those who ended up in Israel. And, but I just didn't have a chance to analyze that. That is a great question. All right, there is actually a question for Sari Siegel. Yeah. Um, is, uh, That's why I said that. Thing, are you incorporating scholarly approaches beyond history, such as psychology or sociology? I think as I write this up, I definitely would love this to be interdisciplinary and would really like to do that because I think it would be really helpful. And when I get to the writing stage, I would definitely like to do that. Um, but I'm, I haven't quite gotten there, but definitely I would like to do that. Thank you for the question. All right, so Diana Gring is asking uh, whether you used additional material like interview reports to learn more about the circumstances of the interviews, such as connection between interviewer and survivor contact before and after the interview, et cetera. That's also something that I think I would really like to do long term, but I, I've so far this is just my like first year of the project, so I haven't just was trying to get through all of the interviews this year. And as you know, it's been kind of crazy last couple of months. So just like, I haven't gotten there yet, but I think that would be, that's a really great suggestion of something to do. Yeah, and to point out for the sake of other uh, attendees, the Shaw Foundation does have such interview reports and these are available uh, to researchers. Uh, so I think we have a hand, so I'm gonna let Marta Manage that now. Yeah, I'm going to call on Miriam. Um, hi, uh, thank you, Allison. Great job. Um, my mother fled from Slovakia to Budapest, and she spoke Hungarian. And she changed her ID papers to become Christian. And she was living at the end of the war with her coworker who wasn't Jewish. And it, after at liberation, she walked into their apartment and a Soviet, a Russian, was trying to rape her roommate. So my mother says she was able to stop it by speaking to him because she also spoke Slavic. And that, that was like close to Russian. So she was able to say to him, you know, imagine that it's your wife. and You wouldn't do that. So somehow she was able to talk him out of it. Wow, that's an incredible story. <laughs> That's, thank you for sharing. Wow, that's a really incredible story. Okay, and we have a question from Lauren Reeves, who I am attempting to unmute. You may need to unmute yourself, Lauren. It can take just a second because the person has to unmute that themselves. Was that was a mistake. I'm technology, technologically challenged, sorry. Well, thank I'm, you for coming. It's nice to hear your voice. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there's a question in the um, Q&A about 
um, which is really more for the Shoah Foundation about whether there are current efforts to, to address discrepancies in indexing so that the issue of sexual violence can be rightfully acknowledged and whether the interviewee trainings have been updated to be intentional in being increasingly receptive to sexual assault testimonies and whether any resources were provided for survivors. So I'm just gonna comment on that briefly since that's really more uh, an institutional question than a question that, that Allison can address. So there are current efforts partly supported by the work of our research fellows to look at some terminology in the indexing related to sexual violence and particularly sexual violence against men, which one of our previous um, scholars, affiliated scholars at the center discovered that the indexing wasn't always consistent uh, when it came to sexual violence against men. Sometimes it was not um, indexed as sexual assault, but instead as homosexual activity. So partly as a result of that and also updating the interviewer training, which the current VHA curator Crispin Brooks, current and longtime VHA curator Crispin Brooks is managing, that um, sexual being receptive and welcoming of stories of sexual violence is a priority. Um, there were psychological referrals that were provided for survivors uh, at the time of the uh, interview. So that is the answer to that question. And if you have other questions of this kind, I'm also gonna put my email address as a response to the question. Please feel free to reach out to me with more specific questions sort of surrounding the institutional history and practices um, surrounding this topic. Okay, we have another, oh no, we don't have another hand raised. Um, Badema, I'm gonna turn it back to you to ask some of the Q&A questions. Yes. So we have another question from Maya Cruz, um, and she's asking, are any of the experiences of sexual assault explained or recounted by men? If so, how many compared to the women's stories? And I think you mentioned in the beginning of your lecture that you did listen to a number of mm -hmm. uh, testimonies given by men, so. Yes, uh, some were, um, I, I would have to go back. That's a really good question. I should um, have that number. Um, far, far, far fewer. Um, but I, I, I should really have that number calculated. Um, thank, that's a really great question. Um, and another question from Esther Lossman, who is asking whether the a statue of limitations apply to any of the situations discussed? Uh, um, th I don't think, for, I don't think that these men were ever, uh, I don't think that in, in the situation that these men were ever held accountable at all. So I can't speak for, uh, I mean, I, I do know of cases actually where men in I think I think well like I think Emmett wasn't Emmett Till's father uh like executed for rape in the American and World War II so I mean I think that there were in other armies men were held accountable but I don't know about that's a good question but I'm not aware of any Soviet soldiers being held accountable for these sexual assaults so I'm sure it's long if they would have passed, but I don't think that there was any anyone who was held accountable for this. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Allison. Are there any other questions? There is one comment in the Q&A that I'll read, which is from Eva Maiden, who is herself a Holocaust survivor. Um, she wrote, I attended a meeting on child abuse during Holocaust at a World Federation of Jewish Child Survivors, which was intended for us to debrief in the presence of witnesses who had also experienced this, and it was effective. Oh. Thank you for that comment, Eva. Yes. I know I was, go I was supposed to attend a conference on child sexual assault during, I think it was during World War II this November, which is obviously not happening. 
but something on that subject will be happening at some point, hopefully, when things, things open up again a little bit more. Thank you all okay. for your questions. We have another question, um, an audio question from Ita Gordon, who is a longtime staff member of the Shoah Foundation, indexer, full, fill, filled with knowledge. So, Ita, what is your question? My question is uh, thank you very much, Allison. This was very interesting and excellent. Uh, I was just wondering if you had a chance to also take a look at some of the um, testimonies of very religious survivors and how uh, were these questions even posed by the interviewers? And if so, how did they address it? Uh, and was that done at Yale as well? Uh, I know several over here from that we have from Shoah uh, of the very religious Jewish survivors. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about Yale if they did have a chance to interview um, the Hasidic Jews, uh, Jewish survivors. Did you? Do you have any any comment about that? Well, I um, I noticed that there is a big difference in the level of religious observance between the Jews of Budapest and the ones outside of the city, um, especially in Hungarian occupied territories that were tra like Transylvania and territories that are were Czechoslovakia, now, now maybe Ukraine or Slo Slovakia. And these Jews were much more religious. I didn't actually notice any difference in those testimonies, except of course they had very, very different experience. The Jews of Budapest had very, very different experience to the Jews who were outside of Budapest who were deported mostly to Auschwitz and then were in other camps. But in terms of the ways that they talked about sexual assault, it was all pretty similar. Um, I don't know, the, they were not necessarily Hasidic, but they were tended to be Orthodox. Um, and I and I definitely did not notice a difference in the ways that they discussed this. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Ita. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat asking you to, what was the conference that you just mentioned? What's it called? The one that you may or may yeah. not be going to. I think it, I have to look at exactly what it's called. I think it was child sexual abuse in sex, child sexual assault in is it is going to be in um, Salzburg, Austria, in November. I can look at my email. It um, and can, yes, I can, can get back to you about later, that. Yes, it but it person. it is indefinitely postponed. But it's so it's definitely but it's definitely and I think that they're hoping to put together a edited volume after the conference. So it's definitely something that people are working on. And my contribution for child, they're all teenagers and we're treated like young women. I mean, so they were considered and treated like young women by everybody who was assaulting them, I would say. There was no no case in the in the um I, I didn't have time to show this particular clip from Frances Goldman and her sister Sylvia, where she was talking about um, right after the Germans occupied Hungary, they were talking about the um, Germans soldiers who were coming looking for girls. And she, who was, she was several, like five years older than her sister. And she and the other girls were around like 16 older teenagers were had to hide. Her sister was 11 years old and didn't have to hide because they didn't, she wasn't really considered vulnerable to this. And so the, I guess the German soldiers were, were not looking for prepubescent girls. Um, in that case, it was really, they were considered young women for what it's worth. Thank you. And yeah. thank you to Sonia Hedgepath, who's written the name Sexual Violence Against Children. It was to be held in Salzburg in November. Yeah, thank you, thank you. November. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. Are there any other last questions? We are a little bit running over, but it looks like Ita has another question. So we'll take this question and then we will um, conclude. Ita? If you, um, Allison, 
Yes. Did you notice uh, in the interviewing process, in the interview is a Yale, the Fortune of Archive, and uh, the interview is at Shirwa Foundation. Uh, did you notice any distinctive um, differences of the way they questioned, they, they formulated the questions, what they were able to obtain from uh, the survivors? Were they very different? Did Yale allow, did the, the interviews at Yale allow more expressions of, of uh, sad feelings, crying? And uh, uh, did you find that at Shoah? In other words, what are a couple of distinctive uh, differences that you found of the interviewing process at Yale and at Shoah? Well, I would say that the Shoah Foundation interviews were very structured. And the, the Fortunoff ones, they do definitely have a formula. But I think, first of all, the early ones, as you saw, they, that was more unstructured. They allowed the two sisters to be interviewed together. One of the interviewers also was a Holocaust survivor. So he's sort of like, at some points, he was like, offering some information like how do you say this and so he was kind of like getting involved um the fortune of uh testimonies they are they have like partner they have partner communities that they do their own testimonies and i would say like the biggest difference that i noticed personally were the decades and i would say that the earliest ones i noticed a really big difference between the the ways that survivors were discussing their experiences in the late 70s early 80s versus the testimonies in the 90s and that the, te the there were a lot of fortune off testimonies that were taken in the 90s and there those interviews were very similar to the ones the, of their own show of foundation interviews there weren't that many differences but the ones where there was more of a there was more of a gap in time i noticed more of a difference there but the show of foundation ones are definitely really really structured and they ask the same questions um and i would say maybe there's more flexibility with fortune off ones especially the earlier ones hope that answers your question thank you yes thank you Thank you so much, Ita. And there's a, there's a comment question in the Q&A, and I'll read this and then we'll conclude. Um, can you take into account that a first time interviewer may be more emotional than an interviewer who's had repeat experience and that it may not be a one to one comparison, especially with all the years in between? Yes. And maybe I mean, also not just interviewer, but interviewee as well. Yes, definitely. I think all of this, this is exactly like the external factors that I'm looking at. How do these external factors influence uh, the testimony? So that is definitely another external factor that might influence the testimony. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Allison, so much for your lecture and for uh, the technical challenges. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Great patience. Thank you to all our attendees also. Um, we invite you to join us again in about a month. We're going to have a, a lecture entitled Locating Women in the Revolt, Gender and Spaces of Resistance at Treblinka. So we hope that we see all of you again uh, in a month. And thank you so much for coming. Goodbye, thank everybody. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you.